Hello, astronomy students. This is Sean Kelly at SPCC. This is Earth 101, Chapter 11. How do we measure the stars? And so uh, we're going to talk about how do you find out about the stars? How do you figure out their distance? What is it we need to know? There's a number of really cool topics in this chapter. So I think you are going to enjoy this. This is really cool stuff. So let's go ahead and start off. Uh, here we go, measuring the stars. And number one, we're gonna start off with a little story, story time, everybody. We're gonna ask the question, who is Jim or James Kaler? And uh, tell you a little bit about stars. So this is a story about Jim. Jim Kaler was a fan of binary star systems. And one particular kind of system was really interesting to him. Um, so James Kaler discovered that when he watched these, these pair of binary stars, so binary stars, two stars, that are orbiting a common center of gravity. Um, he noticed something, oops, something really fantastic uh, that sometimes these would light up and they would flash with light. And that light is called a nova. So let's go back to the type of star system that James Kaler talked about. This is a binary star system with one red giant and one white dwarf. So one red giant plus one white dwarf. Now I'm gonna go ahead and draw a little picture for you to remind you how the center of mass works. Now, I do wanna remind you, um, you didn't know this, sorry, you don't, this is new, new information, um, that we have two bodies, right? So two stars, this is a binary star system. And you need to really understand this one because it's a pretty exciting system. We're gonna learn a lot about it. Um, in, in the next couple of chapters, especially. So binary star system with a red giant, red giant and a white dwarf. I don't know why I'm capitalizing it. You probably don't have to capitalize it. Let's go ahead and probably just red, white. Okay, red, red giant and white dwarf. Okay, now a couple of things to know. The more massive star will be the red giant. The less massive star will be the white dwarf, but this is actually a dead star. This is a dead star. It's not alive anymore. This is still living. This is a living star. So one of them is alive and one of them is dead. One of them has more mass and one of them has less mass. Okay, I want you to be able to identify that, right? So red giant is still alive. And just a you know, little clue, our sun's last stage of life before it dies will be a red giant, right? Last living stage will be a red giant. And then it'll die. And guess what it will become? A white dwarf. So these are actually the last two stages of our sun's well, one life, and then the stage it has right after it dies called the white dwarf. So you need to know that, by the way. Our sun will be a red giant, and then it will be a white dwarf after it dies, okay? So here we go, let's draw a little picture. So we've got the more massive star, let's put a big M, and a less massive star, let's put a little M. Okay, and I think I already messed up because of my paper, but whatever, we'll try to make it work. Okay, so where is the center of mass of the system, right? Remember that the two stars will orbit the common center of mass. Now, if this one is much larger, you'd, you'd expect it to be much closer, but the answer is somewhere between the two uh, centers of the stars, right? I'm gonna go ahead and put it right here, just for fun, okay? So now what happens, right? This is our center of mass right here. This big star, the massive star is gonna orbit with this distance away from the center of mass. So this is gonna be its orbital radius. It's gonna have a little circle like this, okay? It will orbit on this little circle, okay? Now, how about this one? Well, this is its orbital distance. And so you can see it's gonna be, I didn't mess up, it's okay. It's gonna be a much bigger circle. So just pretend that those are perfect. It doesn't matter if they're not, okay? So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about this, right? They're dancing apart, right? And they're dancing around the center of mass. But in order to stay in this configuration, if one of the stars is going down, 
right? The star is going down. What does this have, this star have to be doing? This star has to be going up. Now, are they traveling with the same speed? Well, make sure you know that both stars take the same amount of time to do their orbits. But the little mass star has to go through a big orbit. So it has to be going a lot faster. So make sure you draw your arrows. This is our velocities, right? So the velocity for the large mass will be a small velocity. And the little mass will have a much bigger velocity because it has to go all the way around here in the same amount of time that this one goes around here. Okay, so let's finish up this, this drawing and let's put the Earth down here. Okay, far, far away, we are watching these stars. And what do you remember about starlight? When a star is, a, is shining with light, but the star is coming towards us, and the source of light is coming towards us, what do we get? We get a blue shift. Remember, this is the Doppler effect. Okay, we've got a blue shift over here. And over here, we get a red shift. But do we get the same amount of red shift and blue shift? And the answer is no, it depends on your velocity, right? So when you have a small velocity, you have a small shift. When you have a big velocity, you have a large shift, okay? So at any moment when we watch these stars, we would be able to see one of them having a blue shift and the other is a red shift. Now, what do you actually look at? It turns out they actually look at the absorption lines and I'll, I'll show you a picture in a few minutes, but it's the absorption line. But we would see the colors changing going towards a higher frequency when they're blue shifted and going towards a lower frequency when they're red shifted, okay? All right, so that is James Kaler. He studied white dwarf. This is the white dwarf, right? That's our white dwarf. And it's a smaller mass because it's dead. And this is our red giant. Okay, he studied these two kind these systems, right? And he noticed something really interesting. This star would, would actually kind of send out bubbles of material away from it. And some of those bubbles would be intercepted by the little star and eat those little bubbles of matter. And every time the white dwarf eats a little bit of, of the mass from the red giant, it steals matter, right? It, it flashes, right? So every, every time the white dwarf steals, it doesn't real, really steal, but uh, matter from the red giant, we get a flash of light, a brilliant flash of light, because the material is going to land on the surface and instantly fuse, and it's called a nova. Okay, So that is what happens every time the red giant puts a little bit of matter onto the white dwarf, every time the white dwarf steals from the red giant. Every time the white dwarf steals matter from the red giant, you get a nova. Okay, it's a flash of light. And these can go on for years and it's happening year after year, right? Every time something happens where you dump matter onto the white dwarf, you get a flash of light. So novas can happen over and over and over again, okay? So let's go back to our slideshow. And this is a pretty neat thing. So the name that, that we, we give this is a symbiotic binary system. And symbiosis means they, they feed each other, right? They say they depend on one another rather. And so symbiotic systems change their brightness in a regular way, in regular ways over time as mass flows from one star onto the other, okay? So from the red giant onto the white dwarf, that's the direction that the mass is flowing. And every time it does, you get a flash called a nova. Okay, so that's neat. So we actually didn't know that stars died, right? We didn't know that for a very long time. In fact, the ancient Greeks would have said, you know, would have told you that stars are eternal, right? So we really used to believe that stars live forever. We now know that stars are born, they live, and of course they die. And they don't all live and die the same way. And so this chapter begins to introduce you to the concepts of stellar lifetimes. How do they live? How long do they live? Is it all the same time? And the answer is not at all. 
Okay, we're going to see that some stars live very quickly and other stars live for a very long time, much longer than you and I can imagine. Okay, so this is trying to show you that little star could be your white dwarf right here. Okay, uh, so we have lots of stuff to cover and these are some of the topics that we're going to cover today. Okay, so this is lots and lots of stuff. Okay. So these are some of the stellar properties, properties of stars, okay? So you're supposed to know these words and, and what do they mean? You know, it's pretty, pretty simple ideas, but actually not so simple, sorry. Just make sure you know what they are. The luminosity, what is the luminosity of a star? Luminosity of a star is the total amount of light energy per second that is being uh, shining from a star, okay? Luminosity. Another idea that goes with that is called the power. Right? So if you have studied physics before, you might know that word, but if you haven't, it's just okay. Just know that the word power means energy per second. And so this is the luminosity, the light energy per second that is illuminating from a star okay, or leaving a star. Distance, of course, is how far away the star is. The temperature of the star we're referring to is the surface temperature of the star. Okay. The size of the star will be important, the radius, because the, well, we'll talk about that, right? We were talking about dwarfs, which have small radius radii, and giants, which have very large radii. The mass of a star is gonna turn out to be incredibly important. What a star is made of, its composition, and a star's velocity, okay? Now over here, we're gonna see the technique used to measure that, and that's kind of what I'm gonna be talking to you about today. So there's a, there's a parent brightness, actually it's called apparent magnitude and the distance. There's a term called parallax. There's a concept called standard candles that we're gonna talk about tonight, uh, today. And uh, black body radiation, we've talked about before, Wien's law and the Stefan Boltzmann equation kind of go together for black body spectra. And I'll remind you how that works. With binaries, we're gonna see spectral lines changing from blue shift to red shift and back again. And then composition, we look at our absorption spectra. And to measure velocity, again, we're gonna go back to our Doppler effect, okay? So we're gonna go through this together. Um, so don't worry uh, if you don't know what this is, okay? But let's go ahead and start off. Luminosity, it is the intrinsic energy output of a star per second. Sorry, it should say per second, sorry about that. Uh, luminosity can be determined by measuring a star's brightness. So what is brightness? Brightness actually means the intensity of the light. And here's a formula, you could write it down. And again, we've written it down before, so I just wanna remind you what it means. Brightness is the luminosity of the star. We're gonna assume that for, for most of the stars we deal with, that luminosity is something that doesn't change. So the light that's being put out by the star is kind of consistent, and certainly for our sun, it's pretty consistent. But the bottom part is gonna change, right? The distance from the star. We are gonna be closer or further mathematically. And as you get further away, D gets bigger, what happens to brightness? So you're dividing by D, which means that it's gonna go down, right? So some quick and simple ideas. What if you double the distance? Okay, what happens when you double the distance? Then the distance squared is gonna turn out to give you a factor of four. The brightness will be one fourth as large. So we definitely have talked about this because we talked about sunlight. So it's the same concept, right? Brightness could be applied to the sun or to any other star. It is measured in units of watts per meter squared. But in this class, we don't really do a lot of calculations. So more for your information. Okay, so I actually, um, I have a slide here, but I kind of want to just tell you a story. So I think I'm going to go ahead and, and tell you a little story. And this is about a Greek astronomer who was trying to bring order to his star charts. And his name is Hipparchus. Uh, there are several Hipparchus. But this one, uh, if you go look him up, this Hipparchus invented what is called the magnitude scale. And so this is a big deal. This is kind of an important thing for astronomers. Unfortunately, Hipparchus did it a certain way that is kind of backwards and astronomy didn't try to change it. And so we have this very backwards kind of system, but you need to learn it because that's what it is, okay? Hipparchus said that when he looked at the sky, he saw that some stars were brighter and some stars were dimmer. And so he organized the, the stars into six families. 
right? He organized the stars uh, into six families. And these families, he said, were, you know, arranged by their brightness, right? Six families of brightness, sorry, of brightness. So he said that the brightest stars, the brightest stars were called, were the, were the first magnitude, the first magnitude stars. And the dimmest stars that he could see were called the sixth magnitude stars. So now, you know, he did this a long time ago before he had, you know, scientific uh, apparatus to measure the intensity of the stars. He just used his eye. But we kept this, right? We kept this. We kept this idea. We kept this idea that the dimmest star that a human eye can see is a magnitude six. We kept this idea, right? This is the dimmest star that you can see. It's called a magnitude six. Okay, so how does this work? We're going to draw a number line, right? And I'm going to put the number one, and I'm going to put the number six. But you want to understand something important, right? This is our magnitude the magnitude scale, something important, right? Which one is brighter, a one or a six? Well, I just told you, right? This is the brightest. And this is the dimmest. So this is actually, we're going to keep this, the dimmest seen by a naked eye. It's still going to be this six, right? We're going to keep that. But apparently Hipparchus was not very widely traveled because there are stars brighter than a one. So as you go lower on the scale, the stars get brighter, the things get brighter. So what do you do if you go lower than one? And the answer is, well, you go to zero, right? Zero is lower than one. A zero magnitude star is brighter than a one magnitude star. But again, that's not the brightest star. And so it turns out you need to go negative. So things with negative magnitudes are really bright, okay? And it turns out that the, the brightest star in the sky is somewhere between negative one and negative two. It's about, let's say, negative 1.5. And it's the star called Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, the Sirius star. And Sirius is the dog star. It's about uh, negative 1.5 in magnitude, okay? Now, of course, there are things that are brighter than that. And actually, right now, uh, if you get up, uh, actually, you don't even have to get up. If you stay up late, you can actually see Jupiter and Saturn in the sky after about 11. Uh, about 11, I think they start to rise a little bit before 11. And right now, I believe Jupiter is like negative, negative two and a half or something like that, right? Negative, negative, uh, about negative two and a half, Jupiter negative 2.5, okay, negative 2.5. So you got negative three, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so what's brighter than Jupiter? Well, it turns out Venus gets even brighter. Venus gets up to negative four. Venus at its brightest, about negative four. Okay, that's the brightest that we get. Okay, so it's anything brighter than the planet Venus. It turns out that's pretty much the brightest planet that we can have. So planets can be brighter than Sirius, which is a star, okay? And it turns out the brightest planet is Venus, and it gets up to about minus four, maybe a little bit lower than that even. Okay, so is there anything brighter than a, a planet? And the answer is, of course. And in fact, we had it not too long ago. You might say, I'm now I'm going to actually need to break this, right? So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of break the scale a little bit, right? So I'm going to break the scale somehow. Okay, and I'm going to go down here because I have to go really far down and I'm going to put the full moon and the full moon is about negative 13. Okay. And the same thing, um, is there anything brighter than the full moon? And the answer is, well, not in the night sky. That's pretty much the brightest it gets in the night sky. But in the daytime sky, you might know about the sun and the sun is way down here. I'm Again, the scale is not going to be uh, correct. We're going to we're gonna break it. Okay, break it, break it right there. And then we gotta go all the way down. Let's go about to a negative 27. So this is the brightest thing that you and I can see in the sky, okay? So now let's go the other direction. So we said that the six is the highest number 
that can be seen with the naked eye? What if you want to see something that's dimmer than a six? Like a seven is dimmer than a six, right? How do you see it? You need some help. You need binoculars or a telescope, okay? So it turns out that uh, a little telescope, not too, not too big a telescope, can actually see down to like maybe about 12, okay? A magnitude 12, so a small telescope. A larger telescope can do even better than that. Uh, and maybe you could go to like a 16, a large telescope. And then I want to tell you that there's the best telescope off the world. Uh, it could be like a 16. And the best telescope in the world, again, we need to break this, is about positive 30. And that would be the Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope. And that would be about uh, telescope. That would be about positive 30. Okay. So the, the, the brighter it is, the more negative it is, or the, the lower it is on the scale, and the dimmer it is, the higher it is on the scale. Okay, so now um, I, there's a second little piece of this, and I'm going to go ahead and tell you about it. And so I'm going to write the definition of two words for you. One is called the apparent mag. This is actually the apparent. This is the apparent magnitude. I should have told you that. The apparent magnitude is what we're talking about right now. And what is this? It's we use a letter little m. Okay, little m. Actually, I shouldn't put parentheses around it. Let's just put little m. Okay. There's no units, right? The apparent magnitude is how bright something appears from Earth, right? From from our point of view on Earth. So when you look at these numbers, you actually need to know a little bit more. I should have filled in two, three, four five, right, six, seven, et cetera. Uh, but you need to know how the how brightness changes by when you change the number by one or by two or by five, okay? How does the brightness change? So we know that one is brighter than a two and one is brighter than a three and one is brighter for et cetera, but how much brighter is it? Now, let me see, I actually put examples on the slide for you. Let's go ahead and go back to the slide. It might be easier. See how I did. Okay, so let's see if you understand. So Greek astronomer Hipparchus, he said that he could see six different brightness families. The brightest were called the first magnitude stars. So there's a little bit more, uh, and you can see the numbers that I gave you. Um, so Hubble Space Telescope, they put 32. Okay, but anyways, it's okay. It's the right idea. The right idea is that you, the dimmest you can see with the naked eye is a six, okay? Polaris, the North Star is a 2.5. It's not even that bright, actually. Okay. The magnitude scale is a categorization of stellar brightness whereby fainter objects are given higher numbers than brighter ones, right? The higher you go, the dimmer the object is. This is a little confusing. It's kind of backwards. Thank you, Hipparchus. Okay, so let's do some uh, examples for you. A difference of one magnitude number is actually a factor of 2.5 times as bright. So this is something you need to memorize. If you change by one magnitude number and you lower it by one, then it's 2.5 times as bright. Here's an example. In magnitude three, right? This is called the visual magnitude, by the way, because we're talking about visible light. Uh, but sometimes astronomers will, will deal with other types of magnitudes as well, like ultraviolet or infrared or X-ray. Uh, but M equals three, the visual magnitude three, is 2.5 times as bright as a four. You could have said a four is 2.5 times as bright as a five. A one is 2.5 times as bright as a two. As long as there's just one step, then the difference in the brightness is two and a half times. That's a weird number, I know, but you need to memorize that, okay? So what if the magnitude number changes by two, which is brighter, M equal one or M equal three? Well, the lower the number, the brighter the star. Because it's two numbers different, you might think a lot of times people say that it's five times as bright, but that's not the way this works. Every step that you take is a factor of 2.5. So you actually need to do 2.5 times 2.5, 2.5 squared, and that works out to be, you need to memorize this, 6.25 times as bright. So magnitude one, lower number, is 6.25 times as bright as magnitude three, okay? And finally, and this is exactly based on the Hipparchus uh, definition, or uh, original 
numbers, right? How much brighter is, which one's brighter, first of all, a six or a one? And again, the one is the lower number. So lower number is brighter. And how much brighter? The answer is 2.5 times 2.5 times 2.5 times 2.5 times 2.5, 2.5 to the fifth power, which happens to work out perfectly to 100 times. So please memorize one number change, two number change, and five number change, magnitude change. And this is how the apparent magnitude works, okay? Now, there is actually another kind of magnitude, and that is called the absolute magnitude. And it's the same scale that we had before, except it's a little bit different. What you're gonna do is you are gonna talk about the brightness of a star when it is placed 10 parsecs from the Earth. So I, I should mention something kind of interesting. This is actually worth writing down, in fact. Um, if I ask this question, why are some stars bright? Okay, try to ask yourself that question. Why are some stars bright? The answer is, well, there's more than one answer. There's actually two different answers. One of them is that they are close, right? One of them is close. Well, about half of the stars are close to us and that's why they're bright. But otherwise, there's another way that makes stars bright. Remember that the brightness formula is L divided by four pi d squared. So if you put in a really small number here, you get a big brightness. But how else can you get a big brightness? And the answer is very luminous. That means this number L is big. And about half of the stars are very luminous. And that's why we see them as bright. Okay. So either D is small, D is small, or L is big. Those are the two ways to get a big brightness. Okay. But you see, astronomers didn't like this. They didn't like that there's two ways that stars can be bright. And they wanted to come up with a way to say for sure why one thing is brighter than the other. And so they came up with absolute magnitude. So the absolute magnitude solves the problem a little tiny bit, right? If you look at absolute magnitude, all of the stars are going to be 10 parsecs from the Earth. They're not going to be different distances. So this little statement here, obviously we can't move a star. So this is a mathematical operation. And we move the star mathematically to a distance of 10 parsecs. So, it, you know, that's a really funny thing. Um, you know, like, why are we doing that? Well, if I ask you the question, why would some stars be brighter in absolute magnitude? Then the answer is there's only one answer, right? Why are some stars brighter with absolute magnitude? The answer is their luminosity because the distances don't change. So if a star has a lower number on the absolute magnitude scale, then it is a more luminous star, okay? So um, anyways, this is just kind of a, a basic idea. Actually, you know what? Again, I, I, I don't have a slide for this, so I do wanna ask you to maybe just take a look um, here's a funny thing, right? What about our sun? Okay, let's write this down again. Remember what the, abs the apparent magnitude would be? It's negative 27, right? And the distance, what's the distance that we're seeing the sun at negative uh, 27? The answer is 1 AU, right? Which is not very far. It's the distance between the earth and the sun, right? It's not very far. What happens when we, when we go to a distance of 10 parsecs, and if you looked at the slide a few minutes ago, you might have seen that it's 32.6 light years. Well, that's really far away, right? Just for reference, one light year is about 64,000 AU, right? Something like that, okay? So this is a really, really big distance. What happens? What do you think? Is it gonna be brighter or dimmer? when you move it to 10 parsecs, okay? So I hope there's no confusion. The answer is, of course it's dimmer, but what do you think? Why don't you take a guess, right? Make a guess for a second right now. What do you guess? What number do you think it'll become 
when we move it from this distance to this distance. Okay, so it's got to get dimmer. So what does that mean? Go higher or lower? And the answer is higher. Okay, but what do you think the number will be? Well, I don't know if you're going to guess, but the answer is positive five. Right, that's a huge difference. Our sun, if it was seen from 10 parsecs, would not be very bright. Remember, positive six is the dimmest star that you and I can see. You almost can't see the sun, right? It just looks like a dim little star. So our sun is not incredibly luminous. It's not that bad. It's actually just perfect for us. But in fact, we will find out there are some stars that are much, much, much more luminous. Okay. Again, don't do a lot of math though. So just just the idea. Okay, so here uh, are a whole bunch of stars. In fact, these are some of the brightest stars in the sky. And uh, if you take a look, okay, here's Sirius, and I mentioned to you the absolute mag the apparent magnitude. Uh, Procyon. If you might know, you might know some of these names. These are stars that, um, if you were taking the astronomy lab, you'd probably want to know some, uh, the names of them and where they are. Now, some of them are not visible to us in the in the Northern Hemisphere, but we see Procyon, Vega, Arcturus, Capella, Betelgeuse, Rigel. Okay, we see all of those. These two are not visible from uh, Santa Barbara. Okay, so take a look right here. Um, and here's the sun, right? Look at this, negative 27 and then positive five, right? Of course it got dimmer because the distance to our sun is so so small, right? It's really tiny. It's not even a parsec, right? It's much less than a parsec. So let's take a look at Sirius. Sirius has an apparent magnitude of negative 1.44 and an absolute magnitude of 1.45, right? So is this brighter or dimmer? Da, da, da. Well, it's a higher number, so it's dimmer, right? So what happens when we took Sirius from wherever it is to 10 parsecs, it got dimmer. We must have moved it further away, right? And when you look at the actual distance, you can see, yes, it's 2.6. So when you move it from 2.6, which is right here, negative 1.44, to 10 parsecs, which is absolute magnitude, you get something dimmer. Look at this one, right? 0.4 and then 2.68. Did it get brighter or dimmer? It got dimmer. And of course, the reason is because you moved it further away. Now, there are some like Arcturus. Take a look at Arcturus. It's negative 0.05 and now negative 0.31. What happened to Arcturus? It got brighter which means when we moved it to 10 parsecs, it got closer. And the reason is it started at 11 parsecs, 11.1. .1. And you move it to 10, it gets brighter, Okay, a little bit brighter. Same thing here, Capella, 0 0.08, negative 0.48, right? Because it's moving closer when we move it to the 10 parsec distance. So please plan on questions related to this. You don't actually need to do any calculations, but you want to compare apparent magnitude. What happens if the star is less than 10 parsecs from us? When you compare the apparent to the absolute, you will see it get dimmer, right? The number will go higher. What happens when the star is further than 10 parsecs away? When you go from apparent to absolute, it will get brighter, okay? Kind of a simple idea. Uh, so these distances are kind of important. And, you know, this is, uh, this is so the distance kind of dictates how the star will look to us. So stars that are very far away can be dimmer, right, will be dimmer and tend to be dimmer. Uh, and stars that are closer tend to be brighter. But they, the changing distance is going to change the way that we see the stars, okay? But some of the other, so this is actually a relational property. Other properties are intrinsic. The luminosity and the temperature, for example, are intrinsic properties. So it doesn't matter what the distance would be. They have that certain luminosity. They have that certain uh, surface temperature. Okay, so here is a, a concept uh, you need to learn about. It's called parallax. I'm actually gonna stop the screen and look at you. I've actually done this with you before, but I wanna just remind you how it works. Uh, so here's what you do. You got two eyes and you and I use parallax all the time. We, we don't even think about it. We just use it. It lets us determine where things are relative to us, right? And if we move, we see things move in response, and this is called parallax. So parallax is the change in position of an object relative to the background because of the movement of the observer, okay? because of our movement. 
or change an observation point, right? Which is also a kind of movement. So we're gonna do it like this. If you take your thumb and you hold it uh, out at arm's length, let me see if I can show you that, right? And then what you're gonna do is look at the background and then you're gonna wink with one eye and then with the other. And then you're gonna watch, okay? What happens is the thumb shifts position relative to the background. Try that if you can. Okay, the next step is to bring it close to your eyes, right? And then wink again. And what do you see? The closer the thumb is, the greater the shift in position will be. So the shift in position is called the parallax. And we actually measure the angle and it's called the parallax angle. So how do astronomers measure stars parallax? Well, the answer is you've got to have two different places that you take pictures of the stars. And so this is a, this is a key thing, right? Where are we watching from? From Earth. And we want the two positions to be separated from each other. I won't go into details, but the greater the distance between them, the more precisely you can see the change in the angle and the more precise your, your ability to measure the distance will be, okay? So let's go back to our slide and in the in, on the earth, we're gonna go ahead and do this parallax by orbiting the sun, okay? So here we go, at the beginning, we take a picture of a star and we see that this nearby star is in this constellation over here, okay? And then we wanna separate our position from each other by as big a distance as possible. So we go all the way over here to the other side of our orbit. Well, this takes one year altogether to make one orbit, right? So it's six months later, we're gonna be taking our second picture and we're gonna see that the star has moved, right? It's now in a different constellation perhaps, right? And the definition of the parallax angle is you draw a, a line here and then it's this angle right here. So the parallax angle, we don't do these calculations or measurements in, in our class, but the parallax angle is measured in arc seconds, okay? Arc seconds, okay? So actually, let me just go ahead and uh, tell you one more little quick little detail. This is kind of cool. And the, the term parsec, actually you're gonna break it apart, right? So here's, here's the idea. Here's our orbit around the sun. We take a picture here and we take a picture here. And here is a star, right? So we're gonna measure the change so there's these background stars over here. Okay. And this is our parallax angle, parallax angle right here. And we use arc seconds, right? We measure parallax angle in arc seconds, which is uh, a double dash like this. So if you forgot how this works, one degree has 60 arc minutes one arc minute has 60 arc seconds, which means one degree is 3,600 seconds. Okay, so it's a really tiny little distance, okay? So the earth here, and then six months later is here. If your parallax angle is one second, then the distance is exactly one parsec. Okay, so let me write it out. One arc second. A parallax angle of one arc second is a distance of one parsec, right? You see the word parallax angle of one second. So this is where the distance one parsec comes from. So one parsec, which is 3.26 light years, okay? Now, if a star was one parsec from us, then the parallax angle we would measure is one arc second. If it was closer, what would happen to the angle, right? And the answer is the closer it is, the bigger the angle. You get it bigger than one arc second. But it turns out that the nearest star 
is called, actually, I'd like you to know this, it's called Alpha Proxima. Actually, I'm wrong. Sorry, sorry. It's called Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri, and it's about 4.2 light years. So look at this distance and look at this distance. Is it bigger or smaller? Well, it's bigger. So if we actually don't have a star here, but we have a star a little bit further away, this is Proxima Centauri, what's going to happen to the parallax angle if you go further away? And you're supposed to be able to tell me the parallax angle is less than one arc second. Okay. So P is less than one arc second because you're more than one parsec away. The further you go, the smaller this becomes. Okay. So this is a um, this is why Aristotle said the Earth is not moving. He could not see stellar parallax. So there's a formula. If we did formula uh, in this class, you would find out it's not that hard. But you put the distance in parsecs, and the the parallax angle comes out in. Okay, actually, I just realized I've got something else I'd like to show you. Let's go ahead and show you this little thing. I know it's going to a little, be a little weird, but um, I'm going to go ahead and show you this little quick animation. This is somebody showing you the Earth is orbiting the sun. And as it goes around the sun, you'll notice that some of the stars, like these ones, are changing position. Right, as the Earth orbits the Sun. Now, some of the stars don't move. They're too far away to have any parallax. The stars that are closer shift more, and the stars that are further shift less. The stars that are very far away don't shift at all. Okay. Okay. And uh, great. Okay. Go back to our slides. And I posted a link of that if you want to look at it again. Okay, so that's a, a pretty cool thing. Now, there's a concept that's really, really important to us in, in astronomy. And the concept is known as the standard candle. Okay, so you really want to understand there's this concept called standard candle. What does it mean? What is a standard candle? A standard candle is the ability to know the absolute magnitude of a star. Okay, I know the absolute magnitude of a star. Okay, so when you say standard candle, we're saying I know the absolute magnitude of the star. Okay, great. So then what? Well, then you look at that star or a star or object. It doesn't have to just be a star, by the way. It could be anything. And later on, it'll be a galaxy, the brightness of a galaxy, the magnitude, the absolute magnitude of a galaxy, for example. And then you compare that to what you see, right? So actually, let me go ahead and just write this out. What is standard candle? A standard candle is something where you know the absolute magnitude big M. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to compare it to the apparent magnitude little m and they're not going to be the same thing why not well because remember absolute magnitude is a distance of 10 parsecs apparent magnitude is at the real distance but if you compare them what can you calculate using this number and this number together you can calculate this is our conclusion you can calculate the distance. This is so cool, right? So everything in astronomy that we know up until now is based on this technique. If we know the absolute magnitude and we compare it to the apparent magnitude, then we can calculate the distance, okay? That's the standard candle. We want to do this, right? We want to know how far away are the stars? How far away are the galaxies? Okay, so I'm going to tell you about one of the first ones that was developed, and this one unlocked so many others. This is such an exciting story, and you guys are going to, going to get to hear this, but I mean, really, this is amazing, and it's less than 100 years old, what I'm about to tell you. 
So we're going to talk about these things called variable stars. You want to write that down. A variable star is a star that changes its, its luminosity over time, right? So it gets brighter and it gets dimmer and it gets brighter and it gets dimmer, but it has a regular time for that, a regular period. And we are going to credit the woman who figured this out. She is a pretty important person in our life. You need to know her name. Her name is Henrietta Swan Levitt. And she discovered the Cepheid variables in 1908. That's a little more than 100 years ago. Uh, and so she figured out that the Cepheid variables will pulsate with brightness with a very regular pe period. And she showed that the more luminous stars had longer periods, okay? That's, you wanna write that down. But I'm gonna show you a picture right now. This is the relationship she figured out. So Henrietta Swan Levitt, she plotted her observational period luminosities uh, that she calculated against the pulsation period. And she found there's this beautiful pattern, okay? So you wanna write down, the more luminous the variable star is, the longer its pulsation period will be, or vice versa. The longer the pulsation period, right? The higher the luminosity will be. We measure the luminosity in terms of the luminosity of the sun. So you can look at these numbers right here. This is 100 times as luminous as the sun. This is 1,000 times as luminous as the sun. This is 10,000 times as luminous as the sun, right? So it's, uh, it's not brightness, this is luminosity. This is the amount of power being put out by the stars. Okay? So this is a pretty exciting thing. If you can measure the period by watching it for a little while, right? Uh, these period, you know, this is days, this goes up to like, this is not linear by the way, so don't, don't worry too much about that. The basic idea is the more, the longer the period, the higher the luminosity will be. But in this way, I should have mentioned to you that if you know the luminosity, I'm gonna go ahead and stop for a second. This is a big deal. If you know L, the luminosity, then you can put it into this formula and put in 10 parsecs, oops, four pi times 10 parsecs, squared, which means you know the absolute magnitude. If you know the luminosity, you automatically know the absolute magnitude, okay? They're connected to each other, right? As soon as you know one, you know the other. So this is a big deal too. Again, we don't do calculations in this class. If you are finding yourself frustrated that we don't do more math, you should take another class that I teach called Introductory Astrophysics, but we don't do the math. But we do it in astrophysics. We do all of it. Okay. And if that sounds like fun. You should join me. Okay. All right. So you need to know the basic idea. Longer pulsation period, greater luminosity. Greater luminosity, the more, the, the uh, what would happen to the magnitude number? The lower the magnitude number will be. The absolute magnitude number would be lower. Right? The more luminous, lower absolute magnitude number. Something that's 100 times as luminous as the sun, what's going to happen? It's going to have five magnitude numbers lower than the sun's number. Uh, and that would be uh, five lower than positive five. That would be a zero. But again, we don't do the math, so don't worry about it. All right. So that's one big idea. So here's another one. Uh, Wien's Law. Actually, uh, don't worry about Wien's law so much. Let's talk about uh, Wien's law together with what's called the Stefan Boltzmann equation. And if you remember, this gives us something called black body radiation. I'm going to go ahead and show you that in one picture. What is black body radiation? And let's go ahead and I'm going to go ahead and skip over here to the black body radiation tab that I have open. Here it is. Okay. And you might remember how this works. Here's our sun. So this is Wien's law. Where is the peak? Well, the peak depends on temperature. So for our sun, the temperature is about 6,000 Kelvin for the surface, 5,800. Okay. And the temperature gives, or sorry, the peak is right here about in the green. Okay. Now, what does it mean? You get visible light, 
but you also get some ultraviolet light and you get some infrared light and that's most of it okay we don't get much x-ray or gamma rays and we don't get we do get a little bit of radio i guess but it's mainly going to be ultraviolet visible light infrared okay now what if the temperature is much hotter right so we slide this up okay? you could do this yourself at home play with this little app it's kind of cool right the hotter it is what happens to the peak the peak moved this way right now that star peak is in the ultraviolet it puts out more ultraviolet than anything else and how does that star look it looks blue blue stars are incredibly hot you need to know that okay and we're going to talk more about that but anyways blue stars are incredibly hot because the visible part that they emit there's more of the violet and blue and less of the red and the orange okay Let's go to the other side, very, very cool things, right? And they look kind of reddish, okay? And they are, actually have their peak in the infrared, okay? I blow it out, ah, can't, I can't do it too much. But you can see that they emit light, but mainly red and orange and not very much of the violet and the blue. So they look red to our eye. So red stars are cool stars. That's actually a little bit cool. I think we shouldn't go I think 3,000, maybe 2,500 is probably, you know, tw maybe a little lower. I don't know. I'm not sure. I have to go do some research on that. But basically, redder stars are cooler stars. You need to know that. Okay? You need to know that. The peak is in the infrared this time. Almost no ultraviolet being emitted, but the light that comes out is mainly red and orange and not too much violet and blue. Okay. So we have... Um, different colored stars. If we look at the color then, we can determine the temperature, okay? The color of the star, when we split the light, when we look at the spectrum, it tells us the color, the temperature of the star. And from, uh, if we have very close stars, by the way, we have very close stars, we can see them. We can actually measure their size. They look like not just dots, but they look like size. And we can use something called the small angle formula to figure out the size of that star. Um, and then from that, we can figure out the, the luminosity. Okay, we're not going to do that in this class. Okay. Another thing uh, to be aware of is that the mass and, and what it's made of are a big part of stars. Um, how do we know what stars are made of? The answer is the absorption spectra. So remember that when the light of a star, which is a black body radiation, is all the colors, right, shines through the atmosphere, certain colors are missing. So when those colors are missing, we can say what elements are present in the atmosphere of the star and therefore what is in the star itself. So let's talk about those binary stars again, right? We mentioned before that stars orbit each other and they orbit a common center of mass and they are born together probably. They're usually born together. That's usually the case. All right, let's go ahead and start with that. But if you go back to my story, remember that the red giant is still alive and the white dwarf is dead, right? And we said that the masses now are the red giant is more massive and the white dwarf is less massive. But which star began with more mass, okay? And even though we haven't covered it yet, I would like you to know that the more massive star dies first. The more massive star, the one that had more mass when it started, is the one to die first. The white dwarf one must have originally had more mass and then ended up with less mass when it became the white dwarf. But when we look at stars uh, in their binary system, we can calculate their relative mass from the way that they move, right? The more massive star will have a smaller circle and the less massive star will have a larger circle. So we can actually look at that and um, so we're going to talk about three different ways to see binary star systems. And you want to be familiar with them. I want to tell you that one technique is really hard. Another technique has been the way that we find out that stars are binary. And the third technique that we're going to learn is the new technique, which is becoming more popular and probably will end up um, becoming one of the most fruitful techniques. And so the, the first one is called astrometric, right? These are called visual binaries. And the, and the way that we look at them, we actually take pictures and then take another picture and see that they've changed position, okay? And if we can do that, then these are called astrometric binaries. They are changing position as they orbit each other. 
this takes a long time usually. So I want to tell you that this is the hardest technique of all. It's very difficult to actually see two binary stars moving. And, and the, answer, the reason why is they usually take a long time. The humans don't live very long, and we haven't known about this for very long. It's really a hard thing to do. But it's being done, just not very much, okay? So this first technique, astrometric, is probably the least useful. The second technique, up until 15 years ago, was the most important technique and the only real tech. I mean, the real technique that gave us almost all of the binary systems was spectroscopic binary, okay? So if you look right here, this is actually what you look at, okay? So take a look. These dark lines are the absorption spectra. And if you look right here, this line and this line are not in the same position, but actually neither one of them is in the position we would see if we were looking at these gases in the laboratory. And so when we look at this one, we see that this line gets pushed towards the blue side, right? It's blue shifted. And this one gets pushed towards the red, sh uh, red side, it's red shifted. So the blue and the red, unfortunately, you know, astronomers called it that. It probably, it probably should have been, uh, you know, violet shifted and red shifted. But anyways, it, it's not important. This is the term we use for higher frequency. And why would it be higher frequency? The answer is because it's coming towards us. Red shifted, a star is moving away from us. Okay. The third technique, so this is actually, this one is very good. And actually, up until 15 years ago, I would have told you that 95 to 99% of the binary star systems are from this technique. But we have this new technique, and this is the same technique that we talked about before with the exoplanet discoveries, and it's called the transit method. So an eclipsing binary system has one star passing in front of the other star. It's got to be just perfect. Okay, and you watch the light curve for the two stars and you see little dips, okay? Now, I have a little video clip I wanna show you and this one has actually got a little more detail that you need to know because there's a question on your test about this, okay? So you need to know this, okay? And so I wanna show you this and let's just go right here. This is uh, from the ESO and it's an artistic impression and I want you to watch carefully. So you're going to look at the, the, uh, the light curve down below. And what happens is there's a red giant and a, a white dwarf. They don't look very white and red, but anyways, that's what they are. And you want to notice that there's not one, but two dips, right? And what's happening when you get a dip? One star is passing behind the other star. One star is being eclipsed by the other star. So let's talk a little bit about what makes them white and red, right? Why is this red giant red? And you need to tell me now whether it is the hotter star or the cooler star. I'll give you a moment. And we know that it's red, therefore it is the cooler star. The white dwarf is the hotter star, okay? So if you think about it, which one is gonna put out more energy? So from, if you go back we said that the hotter something is, the more light comes out of it. That's the Stefan Boltzmann equation. And the idea is that each square meter of the star, each little, if we could break it up into squares, right? This one obviously has a lot more squares because it's a bigger star. This one has a lot less squares. But if you look at each square meter of the star and you ask how much light comes from it, the hotter star puts out more light per square meter than the cooler star. Now, the cooler star may have a lot more square meters, but anyways, that's not relevant in this problem, okay? If we go back to, uh, uh, let's go ahead and I'm gonna pause the video. I want you to see if you can right here, right? When the little star, the white dwarf, goes behind the red giant, what happens with a dip? Did you get a big dip or a small dip? Well, you got a big dip because we're missing all of the light that came from that hot little star, right? Which is putting out more light per square meter than the big star is. When we get a little bit further on, we can see the white dwarf passing in front of the red giant and we get a little dip because this little star is blocking the light 
uh, behind it. So you're losing some light, but it's putting out a lot of light per square meter. It means you're not losing the light from this one. And so you only get a little dip right here. So there's two dips and the dips tell you which star is passing and which in front of which one, right? Which one's behind, right? So this one, the white dwarf is behind and this one, the white dwarf is in front, okay? So this is uh, an idea that you need to understand. This is called the eclipsing binary and it's the transit method, just like we learned before with the exoplanet. And you're watching a light curve, okay? You're watching a light curve. Okay, so these are three different techniques for measuring, uh, measuring binaries, okay? So uh, when you talk about uh, the star's motion, um, we are gonna talk about two different kinds of velocities. One is called the proper motion. And this one is, is kind of a measure the movement of a star across the sky for a long time. It's gonna take a while, right? It's actually usually, this is really hard to do, okay? Proper motion is really difficult to measure. But you see a star moving, you take the distance that it moved divided by the time and you can, you can get the velocity. Radial velocity means along a radius, which means towards or away from us, right? And you might remember that if you go towards or away from us, you get a Doppler effect. So here is the example. Um, the proper motion is very difficult to detect. We're getting better, we're getting better at it, but it usually takes time, right? So you have to wait a while. And if you see a star moving, then you can take, you can calculate the distance that it moved and divide by the time it took to move and you can get the velocity. This is called proper motion. So it's not towards us, it's not away from us, it's across our field of view. The other one is uh, using radial velocity. Radial velocity means the star is coming towards us, you get the light blue shifted, or away from us, the light is red shifted, okay? And again, you're looking at the absorption spectra in that case. All right, so we are going to now describe uh, you know, how we organize stars. And this is a super neat thing. This is an important part of our course. It's how do you name stars? How do you give them a classification? How do you classify stars? And if, if you've taken biology, you can think about how do you classify uh, biological organisms, the tree of life, right? This is kind of like what we were doing, right? What are we gonna do to, to make a star? How do you classify stars? And so we're gonna call, it's called the HR diagram. We'll talk about why. Okay, so we need to give credit to this woman right here, Annie Jump Cannon, please write her name down. She was in charge of a group of women, they were all women, who were, who were supposed to organize the data that, that had been collected for the you know, last 10 to 20 years. All of these photographic plates with their spectra of the stars and she was told organize this okay make this organized and so um this is kind of a big deal right the astronomers actually didn't know how to organize stars they had no idea and so they just gave her this task and she figured it out and so i'm gonna go ahead and um i like to write on the board at this time i don't have a board but i'll write on paper I'm gonna ask you how you classify things. How do you classify things? Well, uh, we often use the alphabet, right? So actually Annie Jump Cannon, she says, let's use the alphabet. So the first plate, she takes the first plate and remember that you're looking at a star, but they're also looking at the spectra and the absorption lines, right? That's what they're looking at, the spectra, right? A star and the spectra. She's given this information and she says, organize this. Okay, so she takes the first plate out and she says, okay, that's an A star. Okay, that's an A star. Why? Well, because it's the first one I looked at. Okay, and then she gets the next one. And if it's the same, well, it's another A star. But if it's different, then guess what? Now it's a B star, right? And you keep going like this until you, and this is different, right? So I have a different spectra, something different, right? So if the A star, uh, so you've got A stars and now you got B stars, okay? So you got like so on, right? And you start classifying, you start using the alphabet. You got A, B, C, D, blah, 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 blah order that you worried about, right? And then after five years and 5,000 classifications, Annie Jump Cannon and her team Annie Cannon figured it out. 
this is a big deal, right? So what do you do if you figured it out after five years and 5,000 classifications? She finally figured it out. This is not the right order. Not. That was just the order of the alphabet, right? What do you do? You go back and start all over again. And the answer is they decided to use the term, the letters, but just rearrange them in the proper order. And so I'm going to ask you to memorize the proper order, okay? the proper order of stellar classification. What is the, the proper order of stellar classification? You need to memorize this. It's kind of like memorizing the rainbow colors, right? What is the order of the colors? What is the correct order? Okay. And so that is coming up. I'm going to show you that. So, and then we'll talk about why. Why did it work that way? So I'm going to skip the slide. Skip. I'm going to skip the slide and come back to it in just a second. I'll rearrange it. Okay. Skip that. Here it is. You're going to try to remember the following mnemonic, right? A mnemonic is a memory tool. And here it is. O, the B, A, fine girl, kiss me. Okay, I just realized everybody always asks me, um, why did you do that, Sean? And the answer is, I messed up. Sorry about that. Hold on. Let's underline this. I keep forgetting to do that. And now I'm finally remembering. So you guys are going to see it. Let's just go back and let's take a look again. Okay. Here we go, back to the slide. O, B, A, fine girl, if you like guys better, guy, kiss me. But the, the key is the letters, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. That's the correct order. Later we added these, you don't need to know that, okay? But L, T, Y are, are gonna be uh, a little bit further. So what are these, right? What do these letters represent, right? How did she figure this out? What's going on? Okay, so the answer is, I'm gonna go back a slide. Uh, we're gonna go back a slide. It turns out that the classification scheme was the temperature. Okay, so take a look right here. So here's the O, B, A, F, G, K, M, and I want you to jump over here to the temperature. So 42,000, this is the surface temperature, okay? So the hottest stars are the O-class stars. And then what happens, the B stars are the next hottest, and the A stars are the next hottest, and the F stars, and the G stars, and the K stars, and then finally the coolest stars are the M-class stars. So the cooler stars are down here, and the hotter stars are up here. Okay, what else? Well, what about the peak wavelength? We already knew this, but you, you know exactly why this is happening. This is the black body spectra, right? Where is the peak for the re really hot star? In the ultraviolet. Where is the peak for the really cool star? In the infrared, right? You know this already, okay? And then the question is why? Why do some stars have a hotter surface temperature than others? And the answer is right here. It turns out that the secret to the big difference, why are some stars more luminous than others? It has to do with their mass. Okay, so this is the secret that is underneath all of that, right? Why are some stars hotter surface temperature? The answer is they have more mass. Now we've actually talked about this before. What happens when you have more mass? What happens to the pressure in the center of the star? The answer is it's higher. What happens to the temperature in the center of the higher in the star of a more massive star? And the answer is it's higher. What happens to the fusion rate in the center of a higher mass star? And the answer is it is hotter. It is hot, it's hotter, more dense, more concentrated, higher pressure. The fusion rate is higher, which generates more energy which makes the star hotter. So more massive stars are hotter and produce more light. They are more luminous. Less massive stars are, are cooler and produce less light, okay? So this is a big thing. This is a huge thing, okay? And it's gonna help us organize stars into a, a single picture. Okay, so we're gonna classify stars in just a moment. 
Uh, but before we do, I'd like to give you a little analogy just to help you understand. Imagine, suppose we measured the height and weight of everyone at SBCC, then put all of that data in a single picture. What would it look like? Okay. So the weird thing is, this is weird, but again, it's meant to lead you to what we do with stars. Let me go ahead and put the weight on the horizontal, but make it go this way, right? The arrow shows you the direction of increasing weight. So you go this way, it's decreasing, this way is increasing. And the height is on the vertical, but if you go up, you're getting taller, okay? So this is a little funny, but here, this dot is the average, okay? There's an average weight and an average height. You add them all up and divide by the number of people, okay? But obviously, not everyone is average. Okay, so what happens? Well, let's say that you're a little bit taller. What would you expect to be true? On average, right? A taller person has more body. You might expect, I don't know if this makes sense to you, but you might expect that they have more body, they have more weight, okay? A person that's shorter is, has less body, right? There's less body there. You might expect them to have less weight, okay? So I'm going to go ahead and advance, but I, I dumped a lot of stuff on one chart. Here it is, okay? So your average is here, and here's a taller person who's heavier, and here's a shorter person that's lighter. And here is what is called the trend line, okay? And the trend line is something that, you know, kind of I would expect, right? This is kind of what I would expect. Most of the people at City College are going to follow this trend line. So although most people will follow a trend, not everyone will fit on the trend line. In fact, we might say that 90% of the people are going to be on the trend line, but you'll see that there are going to be people that don't fit the trend, right? They're not, they're not on the trend, right? So here's a shorter person who's, uh, uh, oops, I messed up. This is a shorter person who is heavier. I made a mistake. This is a shorter person who's heavier. I should fix that. You fix that. Okay. I'm going to fix it in the slides right now so that you don't get it wrong. This is the shorter person who is heavier. Sorry about that. Okay. Here's a shorter person that is heavier. Try again, Sean. Okay, shorter person who is heavier, and here is a tall person who is lighter, right? They don't fit on the trend line. Okay, but we're going to say that stars kind of have a similar kind of property, right? Most of the stars will follow a trend, and there will be a few that don't follow the trend, okay? So the stars that are on the trend are going to be called main sequence stars. Okay, here we go. So Hertzsprung and Russell took all of the work that was done by Annie Jump Cannon and the Harvard computers, that was what they were called, right? The, the team of women that computed the spectra of stars and organized them were called the Harvard computers. And they put this information onto a single chart and they showed this, right? This is what you see. So this is called an HR diagram. Now I have on the horizontal axis, I have the temperature, but the temperature is getting bigger going this direction. Instead of temperature, I could actually label it with the letters, O, B, A, fine girl, kiss me. And on the vertical axis, I have luminosity, which is going up, but I could also have absolute magnitude. They are connected to each other. Although this number would be going down, right? The negatives would be down here. I'm sorry, it would be reversed. The negatives would be up here for more, uh, more luminous. Uh, anyways, okay. So here is our main sequence. And 90% of the stars are gonna be on the main sequence. But we will also see some stars down here and these are gonna be off the main sequence. Okay, so let's talk about that. If they're here, you can see they're pretty hot because they're over, they're kind of hot, but they're not very luminous. And, and we'll think about why that would be. Even though they're very hot, they don't put out a lot of light. What does that mean? Well, the reason they don't is because they're very small, right? And so these are gonna be our white dwarfs down here, you need to know that, white dwarfs, okay? Now, if you look over here, right, there's some groups of stars, actually, and um, if you look up here, we have stars that are a little bit above the main sequence, and then that are some uh, really high above the main sequence. So actually, I'm gonna stop, and I'm gonna show you how I would draw this chart. Let me just draw this a little bit differently to kind of reflect what we've what we've been talking about. 
Okay, so this is our picture. So we're gonna draw an HR diagram. This is what you should have in your notes, okay? So it can be either the luminosity or the absolute magnitude, either one, okay? But here is the temperature, right, in Kelvin. Or you could you could label it with the, the letters, right? So O, I would like you to know this. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. O, B, A, fine, girl or guy or giraffe, kiss me, okay? And the, the line, the main sequence goes something like this. Okay, that's the main sequence. The main sequence, is going to be 90% of stars. Okay, you might be asking why, but I'll get back to that in just a few minutes. Okay. Now, if I make a vertical line right here, see anything on this vertical line, vertical line, what can you say? They are the same temperature. Okay. And by the way, these are these are going to be kind of cool. Remember the M's are the very cool ones. So I want to talk about three places. One on the main sequence, another a little bit above, and then one way up here. Okay. And so they are the same temperature. In fact, what color would they be? And the answer is they're all going to be red. Red, red, red. They're all red. Okay, but what's different, right? This lowest one on the main sequence has the lowest luminosity. This one has more, and this one has even more. So why is it so small? And the reason is because it's a small star and it's red in color because of the temperature, but we call this a red dwarf. So if I ask you what a red dwarf is, it's on the main sequence. And it's over here about M, right? And it's a reddish color, small star. Okay, there's a reason I want you to know that, okay? And then now we go a little bit higher. Same temperature, right? It's a vertical line, same temperature, but a lot more light. How does that work? Well, it's a bigger star. In fact, we're gonna call it a red giant, right? Red giants are above, red dwarfs are red because of the temperature, but giant because they're big. Okay, and finally, way up here, we get something that is even bigger. And so much bigger than a giant. Well, we call them super giants. Okay, that's great. Okay, now I actually need to show you one more cool thing, really important thing here, right? Okay, so down here, there's where the white dwarfs. Okay, so I've drawn for you what you really need to know, but you need to know a couple more things, okay? So, it turns out that these letters were not quite enough. We further subdivide. Uh, we we put put a number after after a letter. So, for example, G zero, G one, G two. Right. This is getting cooler. Right. Cooler. The letter G two is is further. Right. So it would be G nine. Right. And then it would be M. I'm sorry, K, K zero, like that, right? So in between every letter, we have these sub letters right here. And the reason I want you to know that is because you and I live near a star and that star is our sun. And I would like you to know the classification of our sun. It is G2, it's a G2 star. And then the last thing is the letter V, okay? So we, our sun is, our sun, sorry, is a G2 classification, which means it's not super hot. It's kind of over here. We know it's about 6,000 Kelvin. And then the last thing is the V. The V says that it is a main sequence star. So here's the deal. You guys already learned this, but why is a main sequence star a main sequence star? Let me remind you, it is fusing hydrogen into helium in the core. And so all stars do that. Every star does that when they start. Every star starts as a main sequence star. 
And it turns out that stars spend 90% of their life on the main sequence. So if I ask you the question, why are 90% of the stars on the main sequence? The answer is because a star spends 90% of its life fusing hydrogen into helium in the core. And the last 10% of its life not doing that. Okay? So this is an important little tiny detail, right? A tiny little detail that you need to know. Okay. And then the last thing, well, we'll get back to it on the slides. I'll get back to it on the slides. Okay, so we have this relationship um, where the, the hotter stars are higher on the main sequence and the cooler stars are lower on the main sequence. That's actually always true. Uh, and why? Why would that be? Well, remember that the radiation pressure generated by the, the core fusing will push against gravity. And which force is bigger, the push out or the push in? And the answer is they are in equilibrium, hydrostatic equilibrium, okay? But here's, the, here's a really big thing, okay? So it turns out that if you look at the reason why some stars are more luminous, the answer is the mass, right? So if you look right here, this is the, the luminosity of the sun. If you go right here, you find our sun, which has a mass of one, right? Because we're measuring in terms of the mass of our sun. But if you look, as you go up the main sequence, what happens to the mass? And the answer is they have more mass, right? If you go up the main sequence, they have more mass, which means they're going to be hotter, right? They're going to fuse faster. They're going to be hotter, right? The higher you go, the more mass they have. The most massive stars are the hottest stars. Let's go the other direction. If you go down the main sequence, the stars have less mass, okay? So O stars are very massive and hot and very luminous. M stars are a very small mass. Uh, they are less luminous and they are cooler, okay? That's all true as you follow the main sequence, okay? So there is an interesting thing that you want to be aware of that the, the heat of the, so the temperature of a star and the mass of a star also determines how long it will live on the main sequence. So the most luminous stars, turns out they don't live very long on the main sequence. They use their fuel very quickly. They burn themselves out incredibly fast. And the very small mass stars we're going to learn are so efficient that they live an incredibly long time. And then our little sun right here lives. Actually, you're supposed to know this already. How long does our sun spend on the main sequence? Well, it's going to spend a total of 10 billion years. You need to memorize that, okay? It's spent 5 billion years so far. Got another 5 billion to go, okay? But here is an actual formula. Now, is this class a formula class? Not at all. And so instead of giving you a formula, just so you're aware, there is a formula that tells you how long a star will live on the main sequence. And it's a complicated looking formula, don't worry. This is the mass of the star, and you divide by the mass of the sun, and you raise it to the negative 2.5 power, and you multiply by 2 to 10. Okay, don't worry about that. You don't need to know that. So what instead I'm going to ask you to memorize is, number one, our sun, which has a mass of one solar mass has a life expectancy on the main sequence of 10 billion years. And then let's jump down. If you had a star that had a hundred times the mass of our sun, hundred solar masses, then it would only live, write it down, 100,000 years. What? Hundred, not millions, not billions, 100,000 years, right? These supermassive stars burn themselves out in a heartbeat compared to the other stars, okay? Now let's go the other way. The smallest star, which can be a star, is 0 0.08 solar masses, 8% the mass of the sun, right? That's enough to start the fusion process and become a star. These stars, which are called red dwarfs, will live for 5.5 trillion years, trillion years. Okay, now let's go ahead and stop for a moment.
And I need you to remember that the universe right now is 13.6 billion years old. Okay. Now let's look along this chart and I want you to notice something. So if you have a mass of one, uh, one solar mass, you have a, a lifetime of 10 billion years. Are there any stars, the mass of our sun, which could have burned out already? And the answer is, well, definitely. If the universe is 13.6 billion, as long as the star started more than 3.6, uh, sorry, more than 10 billion years ago, then it can burn out, right? But if a star started less than 10 billion years ago, it's still going to be going strong, okay, like our sun. Now, let's look right here at a two solar mass star. They only last two billion years. Have any of these burned out? And the answer is sure, lots and lots of them. In fact, most of them that have ever lived are gone already, right? They lived and died already. So the more massive stars die quickly, the less massive stars live a longer time. Let's take a look right here. If you had a star with a mass of 0.75, three quarters, 75%, the mass of the sun, it has a lifetime of 20 billion years. Have any of them burned out yet? And the answer is the universe is only 13.6 billion years old. It doesn't matter when they formed, none of them could have burned out yet. They're just, they live too long. And certainly none of these, so anything with a smaller mass is still alive from the day it was born. There are no stars that have died. Okay, we are going to be learning that the stars die in very different ways. In fact, the more massive stars are going to blow up in a supernova, and the less massive stars are just going to go out in a, in a kind of a small whimper, and they're going to be white dwarfs when you're done. Okay, so you're going to get a supernova, or you're going to get a white dwarf. Okay, that's pretty much the ending. Um, okay, so we want to kind of look at how you get there, and then do one final piece, uh, which is look at a cluster, a certain type of cluster. Okay. So um, we're going to skip this slide, but anyways, uh, yeah, well, actually, sorry, we're not going to, I can't skip this, this is important. Uh, we do want to remember that in the beginning, in the beginning, the, when, when a star is very young, it has mostly hydrogen. But let's say you have a very massive star, what's it going to do? It's going to burn its fuel, the hydrogen is going to turn into helium in the core. So what happens is the, helium, the hydrogen goes down and the helium goes up, and eventually, when you, when you run out of hydrogen, then you can't be a main sequence star anymore, right? You don't have any hydrogen left in the core, you run out, right? When you run out of hydrogen in your core, you can't be a main sequence star anymore because you can't use the hydrogen. So uh, Phil talks about this, the hydrogen fuel becomes the helium ash, right? That's the name that we give the product of the fusion reaction. And the ash is gonna accumulate and accumulate and accumulate until there's nothing left of the fuel. And then you're gonna run out of fuel. What's gonna happen is that the core is no longer gonna have fuel to keep itself from collapsing and it will slowly begin to collapse. Okay, we'll talk more about that in the next lecture. Okay, but anyways, um, that is gonna be an important idea. Uh, so here is a, uh, a, our sun, let's take a look right here. Uh, so this track coming in, this is the track of the protostar, right? The track of the, the gas cloud collapsing and becoming a star. And here is what happens after the sun is done, okay? So the sun is going to live for 10 billion years as, as this yellow star that we know and love. And at the end of that 10 billion years, it's going to leave again. So here is the protostar stage. It can take uh, maybe millions of years to thousands, thousands of, to millions of years. And then it's gonna last for 10 billion years on the main sequence. And then as it leaves the main sequence, what is it gonna become? And it's going to become a red giant. Okay, you, you do need to know that, but not too much yet. We're gonna talk about the next stage of the sun's life in, in the next lecture. But the idea is that once you run out of hydrogen, you can't stay on the main sequence anymore and the reason until you leave. But the reason you leave is because you're really going to be doing something different inside your body. Okay. So leaving the main, so getting to the main sequence and leaving the main sequence is all about your mass. So the more mass you have, 
the faster you can collapse and get to the main sequence, and then the faster you leave the main sequence and die. Okay? So everything about a star's life and death has to do with its mass. As you go up the main sequence, you get more massive. As you go down the main sequence, you get less massive. Okay, so here is a beautiful cluster. Oh, these are so beautiful to look at. I, I was looking at one the other night. It's called M13, the Great Globular Cluster in Hercules. But these are called globular clusters. So please write down that name. What is a globular cluster? It is a cluster of thousands of stars, maybe tens of thousands of stars, that are being held together forever by the force of gravity. And you want to write down that these stars will stay together forever. They were born together and they will die together. Okay, so these are stars that are born and live and die together. Okay. And there's thousands and thousands of stars. So they look like spheres. Okay, so globular clusters look like spheres. So I'm going to stop for a moment. And I'm going to show you something important that you want to know. How, when you look at a globular cluster, what do you see? Now, I should tell you that these clusters are really old. In fact, the ones we have, we have uh, 157. You're going to learn this, but I'll go ahead and write it down for you. Globular clusters. Orbiting the core of the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, so you write that down now, and then later we'll talk more about that galaxy. Okay, that'll be something later we learn. But, anyways, the idea is that they are, they're massive, massive, and they hold themselves together. with gravity, right? So how do they look? They look spherical. They look like spheres in shape, right? Spherical in shape. So they're called globular clusters. Okay, so what happens when you do an HR diagram, HR diagram of a globular cluster? What does it look like, right? So remember we have uh, luminosity or absolute magnitude, and we have O, B, A, I'm trying to help you remember, fine, giraffe, kiss me, okay? And then I'm gonna put a little dotted line. Okay. And then I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about something that we see, right? So if the cluster is old, let me make a little note, old cluster, actually we think they're about 13 billion years old, Okay, they're pretty old, right? 13 billion years old. I want you to think about what that means, right? If you, if you look at this, you see something very peculiar. You see that, that not all of the main sequence is there. That there's, there's a part of the main sequence Actually, wow, it's missing a lot, actually. There's a part of the main sequence, right, that's still there, but the other part is missing, right? It's not there. And there's this weird branch over here. So what happened to all these stars, right? Where are these ones? And the answer is because it's an old cluster, the massive stars left the main sequence. They aged off of the main sequence and they've turned into giants and super giants, or maybe they're just gone, right? Uh, so uh, anyways, this is what happens, right? And so if you look very carefully, uh, how do we know that they're 13 billion years old? Well, the answer is you look right here. This is called the turnoff point. And you say to yourself, hey, Where's that star? And you, you figure out, you go back down and you say, what is the classification of the star, right? What was it? What kind of a star is it? And from this, you know the temperature, you know the mass, right? You know the mass of the star. So using the turnoff point, the mass of the star, 
you go and you use that formula for how long a star is supposed to be on the main sequence. And you say, how long ago did this star form if it's gone? And so what does the turnoff point tell you? It tells you the age of the cluster. So you want to remember that for a, a globular cluster, this turnoff point will show that you still have the stars here that, would, that have less mass, but the more massive stars have left the building, right? They've left the main sequence, right? And your this turnoff point tells you the age of the cluster. Okay, we're almost done. I think actually we're very close to being done. So here it is, a, a real cluster shows something like this, but you would say, is this an old cluster or a young cluster? And the answer is because these small mass stars are here and the large mass stars are missing, this is an old cluster. I know there's some little details that don't look right, but don't worry about that right now. I'm just showing you this is real data, right? This is real data, it's not perfect, but you're missing all of this stuff. And the turnoff point tells you the age of the cluster. Okay, so we have, um, we have covered quite a bit here and there is one final topic that you wanna be aware of. Uh, number one, when the Big Bang started the universe, right? The only elements that we had were hydrogen and helium. And then what? Well, then the first stars began. These are the first generations of stars. So what elements were in the first generations of stars? Hydrogen and helium. But stars are atom factories. They build atoms that are heavier and heavier, more and more massive. And they start building things from the hydrogen. The hydrogen turns into helium. Later on, we'll learn helium turns into carbon, et cetera. So what happens is you generate higher and higher uh, elements on the periodic table. And we call these elements that are higher on the periodic table, we call this metallicity. So the first generations of stars had no metallicity, but then what happened? They died and they spread their material out into the universe and actually started the next generation of stars. So they enriched the next generation of stars with, their, with the material that they made. So they became a little, had a little bit of metallicity, but as they lived and then died, they generated the next stage. And what happens is each stage is enriched with more and more stuff. Now, the fact is that human beings are made with carbon as their foundation, right? The DNA is based on carbon. We are coming from stardust that was created and spread to the universe and then reorganized uh, when our sun formed. Our sun is not a first generation, second generation. It's either a third or fourth generation star in the Milky Way. And you can think about that, right? The Milky Way is 13.3 billion years old. Our sun is only 5 billion years old, right? So the first stars formed 13.3 billion years ago. And by the way, we can see them in these globular clusters. That's actually how old we, we know the, the galaxy is. All right. so. When astronomers look at stars, it's a, it's a really beautiful thing. We can actually see stars all around us. And, and the question that, that you might have to yourself, how do we know that stars really work this way? I mean, do we actually watch a star live and die? Is that possible? And the answer is, of course not. We can't do that. But we've learned something important, right? That, that stars are far away from us. And in fact, we measure that distance in light years, okay, or parsecs, but let's say light years. And remember that a, a light year is the distance that light travels in one year. So if we're looking at a star that's 100 light years away from us, when we see that star, we don't see it as it is today. We see it as it was 100 years ago, right? What about a star that's 1,000 light years away? That's the same idea, right? We're not looking at it as it is today, but as it was a thousand light uh, years ago. And so what we can do is at the same time that we are alive, we can look at stars that are greater and greater distance away. And it's like looking back in time and seeing what those stars were like earlier in their lifetimes, right? So when we see stars that are similar to each other, they have the same position on the HR diagram, right? They have the same position on the HR diagram. They have similar 
mass, right? And have a similar lifetime. But we can see them if they're further away, we can see them earlier in their life, then we can actually infer what a single star's lifetime would be all about. And so this is an amazing thing that we've done in astronomy by realizing that stars are very far away. We have effectively looked back in time at what stars look like earlier in their life and, and then inferred what they must what they eventually will go through. Okay. So we're going to continue with this in the next lecture, but I am now finished with chapter 11.